Uh, where to start? The preamble for this uh, presentation comes from the utter frustration that I have with rolling out open source and open standards um, based software and technology uh, in a large public sector organisation. So uh, at the sort of when I, I started in uh, 2014 as the CIO uh, with, with, this, uh, with the public health service, I was at, with the private health service in Townsville before that. And there was a number of projects I wanted to do and I thought, you know, once I finally got to the top tier of you know, IT management, I thought I'd have enough prowess, um, political capital um, to get my own way. Um, much to my dismay, that's not the case, especially working for around the public sector, um, because obviously we have um, uh, agencies and governance layers above us. So at the, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, I actually started writing all of these excuses down in the back of my diary, just because I thought it'd be a, a, cute, a cute little exercise in, um, in sort of uh, trying to keep, keep me sane. And towards the end of the year, they actually started grouping together. So not with any sort of scientific um, method at all. I put together a list of the 10 most common uh, barriers, is the polite way of saying, excuses, some might say, um, or, you know, basically um, uh, crap that people say why you can't do um, uh, open source technology. And if you want to know, uh, number, number one had about 86 hits and number, and number 10 had about four hits. So that's sort of the, the range. Don't, I'm not going to tell you what the N is and all that sort of stuff because it's not actually proper statistics. So, uh, who are we? We're a public health service that covers uh, 23,000 times the size of Singapore. Um, that's the health service area. We're also a tertiary referring hospital for that sort of... Uh, green triangle rhombus uh, shaped thing there. So we, we get tertiary referrals from Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, um, bits of Micronesia and that sort of stuff. So um, we're big uh, and it's a fun hospital to work for and health service because we get a lot of really different cases. Um, the static population of our, of our catchment area for our secondary and tertiary is, is about uh, 300,000. So obviously probably about what, one, one fifth of the, the, uh, the population, of, sorry, no, one, one twentieth of the population of um, Singapore. Um, we employ about 6,000 staff. It's about two-thirds clinical, one-third administrative in, in rough terms. We provide 65,000 inpatient occasions, so that's people who actually obviously get admitted to hospital. And we have more than 62,000 emergency department attendances uh, each year. Gives you an idea of how big the, uh, the organisation is. Um, I have a, I have a, uh, a long sordid history in open source. Uh, I was part of the formation of a software uh, startup in 1996. Uh, we did quite a lot of open source technology, quite a lot of open source development. Um, it went incredibly well for many years, then went incredibly badly for, for a number of years. Those years were 2000, 2001. Um, so I moved on uh, with the Australian Overseas Aid Service. I worked in Vanuatu and as a side project, I set up the first um, free mail exchange server in, in um, Vanuatu, which was uh, used to provide um, uh, basically basic email services, just a dial-up email service. We will um, send mail um, server kicking on in the background. Certainly changed a lot of things. Really cute application of a small technology that made a big difference because finally NGOs and non-government organisations in Vanuatu were able to actually use email and join the rest of, say, the donor organisations and being sending and receiving email. Um, I, I used to uh, be part of, I used to lead a, um, a political party in Australia called um, the Australian Democrats in, in the ACT, it's the president of the branch there. And uh, we were actually successful in 2004 in getting uh, open source legislation through the Legislative Assembly, um, basically by changing the Procurement Act, that basically the government needed to actually look at open source to, um, software first before procuring proprietary software. Didn't really do much good, but we had a good tilt at it. Um, in 2006, um, I, I, I was with the um, World Bank sort of backed organ um, funding system with Australian Overseas Volunteers again. And we put together a PNG Coffee Corporation logistics system. We were able to raise the farm gate price of coffee by about five to ten percent, which was quite quite um, quite good for them. You know, obviously that's the main thing that they involve. But I was in Cambodia in 2009, helped with the development of Moon OS. Um, it's not really going as well as it used to, but um, it was the first Cambodian language operating system um, around, which 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 did did quite a lot of good things. And obviously, currently I'm the CIO of Townsville Hospital and Health Service. I'm not going look at me, but I just wanted to say I am actually 
deeply committed to open source technologies and the the use of open source um, well, we say open source methodology to, to try and um, get outcomes for organisations. I'm not a hardcore coder or programmer in any way, but um, I guess I sold my soul to being management now, so I can't really go back. Um, number one reason. Difficulty. Like I said, it scored 86 or 84 times in the back of the, in the, back of the diary. Three main reasons. It's tricky for the uninitiated user to use. Um, user interfaces are far inferior to those of other operating systems. Not that anyone really uses them um, or in, in my workspace. It's just not what I'm used to. So the first barrier that we're up against is basically an uninformed user base that doesn't really understand the opportunities that there are with open source mitigating the challenges of actually using it. I'm going to go through the slides reasonably quickly um, because uh, at LinuxConf, uh, I ran a similar situation, a similar scenario, and um, we had a lot of questions, and I didn't have enough time, so I'm going to try and get through this fairly quickly. And then there looks like a lot of uh, informed people here, so it'd be great to have a, a bit of discussion about um, what your thoughts are on them. Uh, <coughs> the second, it's the default, and this is mostly your technical um, people that give you this. Um, the exchange of documents with suppliers or customers or internal people. Proprietary software vendors have already gone into things like universities and training colleges and trained the students to use their software. This was um, a large problem in the engineering sector in Australia because um, there's a particular um, AutoCAD um, developer and, and a vendor that will actually give the licenses for free and the software for free to the students so that by the time they actually get into the engineering firms, they don't want to use anything else because it costs them too much productivity. Even if there is a mandated uh, company default software. Um, uh, not identical in terms of functionality, user interface, performance, plugins, yada yada yada. Uh, that's a little bit of a bleed from the last slide, but the reason it's in this one is that basically people get used to using things in a particular way and don't really want to commit um, any extra training. In an organisation like a health service, you quite often have people coming to you saying, well, you're putting in this new software, what sort of training are you going to provide? What are you going to do? And those sorts of things. Um, it's, it's interesting that computer literacy and literacy within information systems isn't actually considered to be a core part of people's jobs or a skill that they need to maintain. Um, for say, if, for example, a nurse needs to continue to have basic life support. She needs to know, well, they need to know how to do uh, CPR and, and, and give mouth to mouth, those sorts of things. And that's just part of their job. They need to keep that training up to date to keep their job. However, IT, skills and literacy is not one of those things. It's an interesting dichotomy in the zeitgeist. Number three, support. You would have thought it was number one, but it actually comes in at number three. Um, <coughs> paying for guaranteed vendor response. Admittingly, the open source sector isn't very um, developed in Australia and often we lack um, large or what would be considered to be large organisations to actually back software to provide solutions for the organisation. Um, Free Libre open, uh, open Source Community. So obviously the acronyms change. You know, FOSS, FLOSS, Libre or Open Source are interchangeable in, in our community. So I'm just going to stick with FLOSS at the moment. Um, community responds quickly to queries posted on forums and pages. But yet, sorry, and the dot, dot, dot after that is, but yet you can't pay them to do so. Well, that's the idea that was um, put forward at that particular time. Externalizing risk by giving projects to separate third parties. So it's, it's almost like a catch-22. Because there aren't any large vendors of open source software, there's a catch-22. We can't externalise our risk. Now, within, within the public sector, as opposed to, say, the private sector or community sector, it's not so much financial reasons why um, organisations make decisions or, or the financial impact or the, the, those sorts of things. It often comes down to political capital and the willingness to actually risk one's own what would you say, uh, profile within the organisation. So risk externalisation is a major underlying motivator for many of the public sector leaders that you're trying to actually um, commit to making open source purchases. And if they can't externalise the risk, it's a no-go, no basically. Um, longevity. There's no guarantee that proprietary software vendor will stick with a product. Um, and, co co and on the other way, small, um, small developers may not be around, is, is sort of the, the coefficient of that one. Um, 
Yeah, that, that one's loaded, and I think I'll go on a side tangent if I go through and explain that too much. But that was an interesting one from, a, um, from one of my staff members. Um, if uh, an open source project is small, there's, no, there's, a, there's also a danger that the person behind it may lose interest. And, you know, any, any quick ser a search of um, SourceForge will find many orphan projects. Um, as, as uh, I don't know who quoted it, it's probably an anonymous quote, but you know, they always say that uh, success is many fathers, but failure is the orphan. Um, large ven vendors are likely to be around in a few years and to honor their commitments they give you. Well, I don't exactly agree with that, but it's a reason that's often put forward by many um, public sector leaders why they don't want to adopt open source. Uh, uh, th this is actually not so much a reason why, but a reason sometimes to actually question whether or not something's actually open source. The cloud, which unfortunately I, you know, I mean, words like the cloud, digital disruption, and um, innovative excellence get overused in the Australian public sector in, in its verbiage, and I'll probably vomit the next time I hear it used by an uninformed user, but basically even if the hosted software is built entirely on open source software, you don't access, you don't normally get access to the so software anyway. So, or to the code, I should say, the code base, either in escrow or in some other mechanism to make sure that if they were to go out of um, business or if they were to be attacked or any of those scenarios why you'd want to look at their source code or even quality control, you don't of often get uh, access to it because they just say, look, you're buying it as a service, you don't have rights to do that, those sorts of things. Uh, the benefits of using the cloud solution as a service model often outweigh the disadvantage of not having access to the source code. That's the counter argument for that. Is basically, if it ain't broke, who cares? I don't have to fix it. Why would I be why, why would I be worried about the source code? So yeah, let's let's use the cloud, but it doesn't really matter to me if it's open source cloud or if it's not open source cloud, or how much the vendor wants to put the code into, say, open forums, and those sorts of things. It's yeah, that, that, that's, that, that number five is one of the ones I get very um, passionate about in arguing and debating. Um, closed hardware. <laughs> well, obviously our session beforehand obviously was a, a great leader into this. Um, and I think most of the points were covered in the previous uh, session. Um, proprietary hardware has specialised uh, drivers, often closed source is, is, um, is not available uh, from the uh, manufacturer. Um, What's really interesting about that is that we have quite a lot of biomedical devices that are locked down like uh, Fort Knox. And quite often when integrating a system into a hospital scenario, the biometric device or biomedical device may not actually work with, even though it might be running on say some sort of um, light window system or light Linux system, because the interfacing, even though there's HL7 and a number of standards, if, because it's proprietary, often they're standalone devices. So when trying to implement a um, electronic medical record and get, say, um, I don't know, um, regular observations out of a particular bedside biometrical device, sometimes the vendor won't actually allow you to actually plug your uh, interface layer or your middleware layer in with theirs. And um, there's a number of great examples of that on the internet. Um, uh, when I was working for an engineering firm, and that point number three is important, um, and our previous uh, session was also, you know, basically the developers don't have access to the actual code and the hardware, so therefore they find it very hard to build things for that hardware, um, and that then becomes an ongoing loop. <laughs> you don't really know what the black box is doing. Um, that's a more of a thing why you should have open source, but sort of the counter argument from, you know, there's that thing in the corner, it doesn't break, so we'll just trust it works, and it's got a big, you know, stamp on it from a company that we trust, we'll just leave it alone. But um, literally, my network, um, so on a tangent, I have about 140 staff, I have about 7,000 desktops, and about, I think it's close to 10,000 devices on my network, um, as, as my slab of the network, and then obviously we have a wide area network, which has about 90,000 devices on it. Um, the amount of devices that I don't even know about, and it keeps me awake at night, and thank God I'm in Singapore, I can get some sleep, but um, where the manufacturer just actually has a, a VPN tunnel straight through into its box, and it's sitting in my network, and sure, I've got a quasi-layer-two, layer-three network sitting there, and a bit of security, but 
hey, anyone in the room can tell you the security problems with that. Um, yeah, and that, that leads into the last point. <laughs> of course the vendor needs 24 by 7 um, uh, remote access. Uh, so, A, obviously, from the previous points, if they're a small open source vendor, they're probably not going to be there 24-7 if you need them. And B, you need to give them access all the time anyway. It's not like these devices... It's, it's, some, it's that sort of idea that you often get that people think that if a biometric device goes down, then someone's going to die or some, something's going to happen. But in the end, people still make people better. Machines are only there as a tool, you know? I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard argument to win. Liability. I would have thought it came up higher, but it didn't, because um, people don't actually like to think of it um, this way. Warranties and liability indem indemnity matter a lot, a lot in a risk-adverse public sector, as I mentioned before. Many open source projects aren't backed by commercial organisations, i.e. they're hard to sue. Uh, most um, most organisations, public sector organisations don't actually sue, but it's sort of that same zeitgeist that basically, you know, there's nobody there to be responsible. There's nobody we can go after if it really hits the fan, you know. And um, it, it's a major reason why people don't want to do, want to go with it. I would have thought that it would become number one, but people don't, you have to sort of tease it out of people and say, well, what, what is actually the reason why you don't want to go with an open source solution? And in the end, it is actually that sort of covering one's own reputation. Um, budget. Now this is a complex one that I've sort of jammed a couple of reasons together so it doesn't really it doesn't really fit one particular sort of idea but they all are financial and it comes down to the way within Australia and I think probably other organ other countries have a similar sort of public sector budgeting cycle um, that an organisation is given a certain amount of money and it really needs to expend that money by the end of the financial year otherwise it won't get an increase in funding or a similar amount of funding. It's a, it's a common sort of um, issue. So, um, a few things there. Um, people think free when they see in front of open source, they think of free beer and not free as in freedom. So often it's very, very hard to actually get them to understand that you really should pay for your open source software even though you're not required to do so. I mean, obviously if there's some sort of professional services agreement that you can enter into with an organisation, then that's great. But even if you're using some cute little um, some cute little piece of software that someone's made and just chucked up on SourceForge or on GitHub, and you should probably donate to the to the project. It's just good citizenship. Um, and in an organisation, especially public health, where um, being a good corporate citizen, I mean, there are many say um, that there are many uh, medical. For an example, there are many medical procedures that we do that we we're, that were never fully um, paid for whether by public funds or by private funds, yet we do them anyway because someone's going to die or someone's going to get hurt. So, you know, there, there's, there's generally a culture, you would have thought a culture of basically of good corporate citizenship or, or good community citizenship. But as far as software goes, we're happy to rip off other people's IP and not pay for it. Um, budget structure um, is anti-open source. Uh, it's, it's funny. In a, in a, it, it's something that I, I, I really tackle as a, as a senior executive in, in, a, in a health service. Um, if you can capitalise the money, i.e. it's a project expense, it happens, it's like purchasing some hardware or purchasing, if you say you're doing a project, software's a little bit hard with this sometimes, then it's far easier to get the money than if it's an operational cost. Because the underlying budget, in Australia we've got this, um, what's yeah. called a, an efficiency dividend, which is basically that each public sector organisation needs to try and run more efficiently by 2% each year. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a... Um, anyway, that's, that's another debate. <laughs> so when I'm putting projects forward, if I can actually capitalise the project, i.e. I can make it a project, a proper project, sorry, I'm using big P and low, low and small P project, then I'm able to get it through the budget, and if I can keep it within a year, then it's just like purchasing a, a new wheel for the car. Done. You know, away we go. But, A, because open source software, especially the smaller end, more of innovative stuff, tends to be, um, tends to be done by small projects, and they, they, they really want you to pay them a monthly fee, which is what you want to do, it's very hard to capitalise. So there's this sort of counterintuitiveness to actually being able to support some of this innovation. Um, uh, and last one, if the open source solution is used to support critical applications uh, quickly and cheaply, it often goes unrecognised and under-resourced. Um, I can't tell you the amount of 
open source software and some well not hard, mostly open source software that just gets put in you know like people go oh I found this online and you know I just run it and away we go whether that is a true open source you know built you know some sort of lamp stack um, web server app or something right through to someone's pinch some um, Excel code from someone else on the internet um, it very rarely goes recognize that it's actually open source and that it's actually um, that it's actually used Anyway, I'm slowing down. I'll keep going. <laughs> um, segues very nicely into intellectual property. The need to protect the organisation from any intellectual property challenges, challenges from open source software. Um, basically, if something goes wrong, someone wants to sue us and it was this piece of software, who's actually responsible? That chain of command, liability once again. Um, Replace, uh, replace any code found to be in violation of intellectual property rights. So, um, it's funny, most of these actually come from our procurement people and they're pretty esoteric. Um, but trying to actually purchase something, you've obviously got to go through the procurement people because you know, they, they pay for things. And what often happens is they're very, very scared about the fact that if a, another company suddenly buys out another company, say like, I don't know, Oracle buying out Sun Microsystems was a big one for us in the, a few years ago, then some of that code then becomes proprietary because it wasn't strictly under the GPL or some other mechanism at the time. Therefore, we have to start paying for it in the future. I don't know of one single case where that's actually happened, but our procurement people are actually quite worried about that. Maybe they studied at university during their degree or something, I don't know. Um, if our own staff contribute to an open source project, who actually, op who actually owns that intellectual property? We're a public sector organisation, I, I would say the public does, so, you know, and there are many mechanisms to do that, but it's a, we don't want to give our IP away just willy-nilly to anybody, even though in the organisation we often, you know, take intellectual property from other people and don't give them credit for it. So it's quite a bizarre, you know, zeitgeist. Um, and <laughs> the last one, whose intellectual property is it anyway? Um, it's often very, very hard to actually nail down who created and who didn't and those sorts of things. Um, this isn't so much uh, a reason, but it was two long conversations I had. And my stance is, you know, as a public sector organisation, Ought not public money go to supporting, you know, open source solutions and open systems and providing code to the public other than, than to a company that's going to basically make profit? And unfortunately, the majority of software in, in, in healthcare is actually for-profit pri proprietary organisations that develop software on the public purse and then make a lot of money for it somewhere else. And so, yeah, anyway, I could go on about that one, but I won't. So um, that's my observations over the first, uh, what would you say, two and a half years of being a CIO in a public sector organisation. Um, a lot of those I was hoping would start a discussion and ask some questions. And so um, I'm happy to take any questions. Silence. Yeah. I thought some of them would be pretty provocative. Do we have questions? No, I, I mean, okay. First of all, I work in a government-related agency, mm -hmm. so this is pretty interesting to me. And we do research, so IP is obviously very important. And I'm surprised that it came number nine in this. Indeed. But, um, but one of the things that I have to deal with also is, I mean, not just open source adoption. Um, we we often see open source as a kind of a shortcut. Uh, or if it's already there and it's working well, we could use that. But there's a bit of a fear also about copyleft licenses mm. because then you can't sell that as your own IP because you have to you have to sh you have to give all all the I this product that you just developed using with the aid of the GPL or with other similar licenses uh, you have to give that out for free because that's the terms of the license. Indeed, so indeed. And hence why so many uh, new licenses have been made, your Apache licenses yeah. and your MIT exactly. licenses and stuff. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. But then if you have um, dominant pieces of software like WordPress, for example, yeah, um, you can't really change your license on that. No. So we've had to find fairly obscure alternatives for a basic CMS function. Wow. And that's kind of... Uh, 
it's a barrier to productivity, mm. I, as some people would say. Mm, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Um, how many of you work in large organisations? Say more than say a hundred people. Yeah, got one, two. So what's um, how how much open source do you work with uh, each day? <laughs> Sorry, I, I work at Google and um, I do open source code in Google coding programs. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with actually a lot of uh, open source organizations outside, external to Google every day. That's my that's my general job is actually working with a lot of organizations that are represented here this weekend. Um, but you know, one of the things that we do in Google, like Kat mentioned earlier, is that we do a lot of uh, releasing our open source team making sure all of the licenses and everything are correct so that our Googlers can release projects that open source code that they're working on. Yeah, indeed. Time, so. I don't know, it's percentage-wise, I think that Google, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, yeah. no, it's good to hear that Google actually does quite a lot of open, open source stuff. I guess um, my, 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 often my frustration at coming to these sorts of um, events is that um, we as we in open source tend to be in our own little bubble sometimes and um, I'm right at that crossroads every single day fighting in the trenches to try and actually get people to use open source and I just find it incredibly difficult to try and you know um, a, a cute story on the side is that um, um, LibreOffice okay so Queensland Queensland Health uh, is was predominantly on an XP environment earlier this earlier well, late last year projects now going through to actually clean out and make Go, make, go to Windows 7, which is a fantastic option. That's sarcasm. Um, and we, through various uh, leadership sort of shortcomings, um, we, we only ended up with, for the, for the odd, 90 odd thousand um, desktops, we only ended up with about 60,000 licenses, sorry, 6,000 licenses for uh, an office upgrade. So from 2003 to 2010. <laughs> which is, of course, then we have a have, have and have not sort of environment, and so my automatic answer was, well, there's LibreOffice, you know, let's let's just roll out LibreOffice, and um, so I had it packaged by my own team, I had it rolled out, and I just basically rolled it out to everybody. Um, they're now in the process, even though they don't have a replacement for everybody for Windows 2010 to even go to 365 or something like that. They're now trying to actually claw back and discourage people from using LibreOffice because of their perceived, um, the perceived threat that it causes with uh, document version control and those sorts of things. Not that the jump from 2003 to 2010 wouldn't cause the same problem. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting mix. And another, sorry, go ahead. No, finish. Oh, no, I was going to start another story, which I can start. Well, I guess related to this and maybe to other topics, so you will not LibreOffice and yeah relatively successfully, despite maybe some pushback, but um, did you have to overcome any of the challenges you mentioned here related to you know having a service provider, having someone to provide support? How did you rationalize that, or did you even have to? Right? People just kind of accepted it in that case. I, well, it, it's mostly basically people were so desperate for something that was better that they, they just lapped it up. But I'm currently in a lot of, in a lot of conversations with people that are, because so within Queensland, there are 16 health services. So we're, we, we're just one of 16. We're the third largest. So the two large hospitals are in Brisbane, our capital city. And uh, my hospital's the largest, um, well, actually, it's the largest hospital outside a capital city in Australia. So it's about a 650 bed facility plus eight other 100 odd bed uh, hospitals. Um, and so when I take leadership on something, people kind of go, oh, because you know we're, we're big, we're not the biggest, but we're big. And no, I'm, I'm currently in, in, in discussions with them about, but it, like I said, it comes back to that literacy argument. It's like, well, do you really need a vendor for an office product? Shouldn't you just use it and get on with it? Um, obviously, we put through, um, through group policies and that sort of stuff. We made sure that it saved to, to um, 2003 first and that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's mitigation. Another great example, though, is um, we were using for our IT uh, asset management, um, the HP OpenView product. And we're transitioning at the moment away from that. And the new, the new system that they're going to go to, well, I won't even discuss, but um, we, we, we we've sort of fell short of actually our asset control and, and, those sort of, and licensing control. So I, obviously, quick market scan, Snipe IT is not a bad product. Um, 
I instructed my server team, there's four of them, uh, to load Snipe IT onto a, a, onto a LAMP stack that I'd already built for them basically, because they were like, oh, we don't do Linux. So I built the LAMP stack and got it all running, but I needed them to do the LDAP and stuff to actually, you know, hook it into the network and that sort of stuff. Literally while I was away on leave in, in, October, in November last year, they took Snipe IT, they ditched my LAMP stack, Obviously, CIOs can't be too technical. I don't know where the problem starts, but um, and they actually engineered it. They got online, clever little sods that they are. They got online and they worked out how to shoehorn the thing into an IIS environment so that they could actually run it. And so, even with direct instruction to staff that are directly reportable to me, they went out of their way, like like a couple of days worth of serious effort, to engineer it in a way to give me the result I wanted to, but have the back end that they wanted to. That's the sort of um, sort of cognitive dissidence that you're actually up against a lot of the time. It's an interesting story. Um, you mentioned something about um, monthly subscriptions were difficult to get a uh, purchasing your purchasing department to to agree to. What um, you know? So it, it's easier to get like a yearly contract with the one big fee. No, in, in fact, it's, it's, it's actually a real problem because um, often when the federal government, which it doesn't have the responsibility in Australia for healthcare, it's, um, it's a, for secondary healthcare, which hospitals are, I should say, um, often when we get projects funded uh, from the federal government to do something, it often is, um, and this is where the capitalisation comes to, into it, it's often a certain amount of money to put in a certain capability as a project. And so the money comes in, it's then put against our budget, but it's... But we're, never, we're very rarely given money to continue that project on, onwards. So often what I have to do is think, how long is this software going to be used for? Maybe four to five years. And I sometimes actually have to capitalise the whole project and I put the whole lot in. And so I will purchase a forward-facing agreement for maybe five years so that I don't have to pay a monthly fee and raise the operating, raise the operating costs of my department. That's, that's the problem. And the problem is when you're mucking around with... Um, with innovative small companies and you're trying something out that might be huge in the future, you can't do that. You, well, you can, but you're going to fall short because there's no way to accurately um, you know, sort of anticipate where you're going to go with that technology. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a real bind. I mean, we, we got a considerable amount of money for, um, there's quite a gap between Indigenous um, health outcomes and um, or First Nations health outcomes, whatever term you like to use, and say um, the, the standard populace and we get a considerable amount of money to do certain things. And it gets really hard to put technology in for this group because federal funding, you know, it's, it's a yearly based thing, sometimes maybe three years, but the life of the technology, I mean, our, our patient administration system is 40 years old at the moment. It's an old green screen um, piece of software from CSC and it still ticks along. I mean, there are banking bits of software that are probably over 60 years old. Sorry. So you have so much problem. How your service provider can help? <laughs> well, I sort of... Well, well, I used to work for a service provider mm. and we had a lot of this kind of conflict with, with customers. So indeed, indeed. And, and I sort of ran this session, it's a modified session from LinuxConf in Australia um, to try and, it was a sort of a how you as a startup can get money from us, the big government. And um, <laughs> it got very depressing actually. <laughs> but um, but there are, there are ways. Um, uh, service provision can be done, but you're looking to make sure that, and, and lot, not a lot of not a lot of open source companies do this. They don't talk about exit points. So if you're going to go to a, a public sector organisation that needs to capitalise the majority of its budget, especially if you're being used for a particular project, might be funded from a different party, you need to say, look, we're going to provide this software. Say you're a SaaS provider, we're going to provide this solution to you for five years, and the cost it is a fixed cost of this. And you'll need to leave it at that. And what that means is that the actual um, innovation risk is then put upon the small provider, which is very dangerous. Having been a, I've been a startup myself, not where you want to be. You want people to actually pay for what they use. But quite a lot of the time, that's what you need to do. But it doesn't mean that you have to be static there. You can call that one project. The biggest, the biggest thing that kills what I've seen, kills small innovation companies and stops large public sector organisations from um, taking on that technology is scope creep. If you can get your scope sorted and you can get your requirements sorted and it's for a project, 
then that's fine. And if that particular, if, if say our health service wanted to use it for something else, you say, well, look, that's actually a different project. Why don't you find some more money and we'll give you another slab of the, the pie? I guess that's the sort of answer. Well, you don't have a Well, that's why you say you use a liberal office, right? Yeah. And liberal office have a version every couple of months. Every couple of months have different blocks, right? So even even that they want to, or even a service provider want to fix the scope. Well, yeah, I mean, Li Libra is not a great, uh, is not a really great example because we're using it for free. Um, I'm still trying to work out a way of actually somehow remunerating um, the, the uh, what do you call it, Open Document Foundation for Libra. I still haven't worked that out yet. I've only got a couple of, I've probably only got maybe 100 and, I think it's 120 users of my 6,000 so far, so it's not a big problem, but I'd like to do something about it, but the majority of the funding I have is for the Office 365 project, so I'm in a bind there as well. But yeah, it's sort of shifting sands. But you know, you're right, you never know where a technology is going to go. There seems to be a lot of talk, at least on the federal level, where you know, DCO and those sorts of things, I mean, I came in late, so I don't know if I can cover that. Is, do you think that is going to help in terms of pushing it down towards the... Uh, very Australian-centric Australian Australian um, <laughs> uh, argument. Um, so the DTO is our digital transition office. It's part of our Department of Communications at a federal level. Um, and uh, what, what my colleague here is uh, talking about is there's a change in our... Well, there seems to be a change in our government, finally, to a more innovative approach. And we're all very excited in Australia because we're a little bit behind everyone else when it comes to innovation at the moment. And they've set up a special department to actually look at, well, not look at, but be sort of a clearinghouse for innovation is, is sort of how I see it. Um, uh, I don't know. The DTO is too young at the moment to actually see how much effect it's going to be. It, the majority of their efforts seems to be with other federal departments. So as a state organisation, I'm not so sure. Um, our main federal sort of interface is through the uh, primary healthcare networks, which is a federally funded... Uh, GP doctor sort of um, push at the moment, sort of a primary care sort of uh, situation, um, and the the My Health record, the National Electronic Health record, um, and I haven't. And, and what I find interesting with your question is, I haven't seen a DTO actually involved in any of that discussion yet. Maybe because I don't have any visibility at the moment. But and if they do get involved with that, that might really be interesting because obviously with the failure of the last well, failure, with the non-success of the last um, private health, um, public health record, it, it might work out. Can, can I ask where, where, you, where you work or what space you're in? I'm actually uh, living here in Singapore, so oh, okay. I just have a passing interest. In well, I can hear the being, Australian being accent, Australian so Australian yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, seeing you come in and you know, taking a group, a lot of learnings, I guess, from in the US and yeah, and, and I think I think uh, when Turnbull set it up when he was Minister for Communications, I think he really was looking at the, uh, what was it, it was 2010 when they started there, was it um, Gov, I forget what the name, was it Gov. Or gov uk project, or what anyway, their, their digital transition, and obviously the CEO of the, digital t of the DTO was actually from the UK who was working in that process, so obviously we've tried to scalp some um, some talent there, so no, I'm I'm really excited to be in Australia, I was away, in a, I was away overseas in 2010, 11 and 12, um, running um, running my own open source um, business intelligence organisation in, in, in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And when I came back to Australia, I got a little bit depressed about where we were. And it seems it seems that we're moving forward, finally. Yeah. If we've run out of questions. Yep, I think we've run out of questions. Look, Thanks everybody. I'm, I'm around for the rest of the conference. Um, I don't have business cards on me. I've already been completely um, pillaged for, uh, for business cards, but I'll have some more tomorrow and um, I'm around to talk to and all that sort of stuff. Thanks very much for turning up. Yes. Um, I noticed you've given this talk before at uh, LinuxCon. Yep. And now it's at Force Asia. Yes. So basically you're preaching to the choir, right? Uh, Is there a way to make the public sector people more aware of um, these limitations and how their excuses or their reasons of their barriers are not as valid as they seem? M my hope was actually the opposite, was that to actually bring the open source community in from the cold and say, well, look, these are actually the expectations that public sector organisations have. Uh, not, that I, not that I feel I'm holier than thou or anything <laughs> like that, but it's really that, um, you know, we have a considerable amount of... Um, 
revenue that we, we need to use for innovation. We only work with proprietary organisations. And this comes down to a great, a really great debate we could have maybe with three aside, is, you know, is it our responsibility to seek out open source um, solutions because we're a public sector organisation and, and somehow coax, coax the open source innovation into the organisation? Or is it the open source community's um, responsibility to aggressively go after um, our revenue and our, and our, and our issues and, and those sorts of things? I think it's probably a hybrid between yeah. the both. That's true. But um, the reason why I come to these sort of conferences to explain things is that I'm a diehard open, so open source person and every single open source organization, not every, so the planet, sorry, I mean, the majority of open source organizations that I work with are just not on the page. They're just not consumer friendly. They're not trying to solve, they, they, want, they, they basically want you to meet them 80% down the road and they don't want to meet you halfway, even if you are an open source person. I mean, uh, I can tell you a hundred examples of where I've tried using open source technology from a service provider, get them, get their funny little hat and feathers, whatever you need to do to be a government supplier, I still think it's a, a dark art, um, and bring them in and, and actually, you know, it, it's like dragging them in from the cold. Um, another process I've tried to use is uh, we have a, um, a, a, an education database that we use it's not it's it's got a learning management system there's a Moodle in there as well but it's basically tracks courses that people have been on and what sort of qualifications they have it's a learning management system but a qualifications management system and that was developed in-house and we actually moved that into github and we get in from we're co-located with James Cook University and we actually get um, normally we start off with a cohort of like 12 or 14 and that whittles down to maybe about three or four hard you know hardcore people and they work on that project for us and so we have an open source and not that that whole project has been implemented somewhere else but parts of that project have been implemented somewhere else within Townsville and I'm, I'm glad that that's happened so even though I even though I'm not remunerating them they're really just getting course points and experience it's it's one way of sort of getting more open source to happen but you know I'd love like I mean what it comes down to is back. I mean, another one was back when I was working for the private organisation in Townsville. We didn't have an electronic medical record, and I literally tried to put a, a cohort of about five or six Catholic hospitals together, and to either implement uh, Open Vista or uh, one of the other um, open source um, uh, ERMs that are out there, uh, electronic medical records, I should say, because the medical record, when you're implementing it, I mean, you're looking at about a hundred thousand dollars per bed. So if you're a 650 bed hospital, just do the sums on that. It's phenomenal. And most of that is in vendor costs and vendor uh, professional costs and change costs, which I think open source could be better at. And um, that's actually the theme of my thesis. So maybe next year I might come back with some learnings on that. <laughs> Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, guys.